All right. Well, Josh, do you want to get started this morning? Sure. Yeah, this is, uh, let me see if my video up and running. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you all for, for joining the call this morning. Um, we're excited to continue our discussion from last week with Dan Clinton. Um, I don't see Dan on the phone right now, but uh, I, m many of you may have already seen his presentation from last week, focusing on urban streams. And um, and then following that, we have um, E. Brantley and Mona Dominguez. Uh, Eve is with the Auburn University Water Resources Center and Mona is with the Alabama Water Watch, and they're going to talk about uh, some inspiring work uh, and, and goals they have to bring people to science and science to people through research, instruction, and extension. And that's mostly, uh, I th I'm hopeful to hear about the 4-H uh, program, the Youth Urban Stream Training. So um, I don't have a set of questions or anything in specific. I missed last week's presentation on urban streams. I know Dan, and I'm sure it was really a great talk. So I, I guess now would be as good a time as any to um, to launch into that. Did who attended or had any particular questions? Um, I think it's a pretty interesting topic, but I'd like to open the floor to hear what other people's particular interests. If you know, if you're working on a project or or, or you missed the presentation. So I uh, want to invite you guys to go ahead and uh, post up if there's anything specific um, we want to discuss on urban streams. You know, I had a pretty uh, interesting experience this last week. I was in Atlanta um, and we walked quite a few stream channels. The Army Corps is supporting, is, is hosting a program uh, to do stream restoration. So they're taking a watershed scale approach. And so we found these different watersheds. They had to qualify for it. And, um, you know, I was pretty amazed. I spent a lot of time in, in the wilderness or, you know, in outdoors in the rural projects, <clears throat> sometimes, um, you know, pretty far from cities, but they're still messed up streams. And but something I, I did notice uh, in, sh in sharing these these few days that we walked about 15 miles of of urban stream was that there was still a lot, a lot of potential, and there was a lot going on. And, you know, as a group, uh, observing the stream and evaluating and assessing it, you know, we were doing a, some sort of a, a blended a rapid assessment, you know, fan cook, RBP kind of stuff. And um, that was quite a bit, uh, it, you know, quite a bit of um, moments. We had a lot of moments where we actually experienced nature uh, in the urban setting. And so, um, it was really inspirational, the the folks I was with and the hope and the potential for the site. And, you know, despite it being an urban stream, plenty of water bottles and, you know, plastic bags and tires, and, you know, the whole myriad of stuff. We still saw blue heron. We saw, you know, we saw, uh, I can't remember what kind of turtle it was. We, we, you know, we, we seined and caught fish. There were bugs in there, you know. We had caddisfly, stonefly, mayfly. You were all present, not not abundantly. Um, and there were features. There were there were some microhabitats, and and there was a lot of inspiration in that urban environment. So, uh, I think one of the things last week uh, to kind of start a conversation off, Josh, is um, Dan is kind of was kind of a unique. Uh, experience in this field so a lot of times we think of uh stream restoration we have to introduce people and have old engineers kind of see the light and look at stream restoration a different way they may be used to designing concrete uh maybe used to kind of minimizing their uncertainty uh and their unknowns uh, but uh, dan clinton was a little bit of a different story dan clinton had started his career um in the late 90s at North Carolina State University, and he got his master's degree on looking at the uh, geomorphic uh, reference parameters in light of some of the Williams 1986 data uh, for geomorphic uh, meander belt width, uh, meander wavelength, radius of curvature values uh, as they're related to some of the 
values that were published by Luna Leopold, uh, you know, even years before 86. So Dan was looking at that data that was created by Williams and saying, what does this look like in North Carolina? So he created his whole master's degree in the late 90s on geomorphic uh, reference reach analysis. And then he was probably one of the first people that I know of to do an urban stream restoration design in North Carolina. Um, and that was in the 2000, that was in early 2000, uh, 2001 probably. Uh, and Dan's story was unique because his story is kind of a little bit like, well, you know, stream restoration can be done, but let's, let's pump the brakes. And he's almost become more of a guy that focuses a little bit more on hard engineering now than trying to put stream restoration into every urban setting. Uh, so the, the, uh, summary of his conversation was, well, sometimes we ask too much of stream restoration and we expect that there's all these urban infrastructure things that have high maintenance requirements because there's just not much floodplain and we think that we can solve it by doing stream restoration when we need to look at traditional engineering approaches uh, in line with stream restoration as an alternative. Um, so the reason that I was excited about Dan sharing his story is Usually we hear people say things like, well, I was a hard engineer and I've uh, learned how to do hard channel design. And then I saw the light and came to stream restoration. And Dan Clinton's story kind of was like, hey, I was a, a green infrastructure, a nature-based solutions type of guy. And then I've seen the light and now I've become a little bit harder stream restoration design designer. And I've done more hard infrastructure. Uh, so I, I'm wondering from anybody else on the line if they had any kind of other similar feels from the conversation with Dan or if anybody felt kind of uneasy, like, Hey, come on, stream restoration should be able to work in more places. So Josh, uh, uh, you know, Dan talked about, uh, with Josh Allen last week um, about kind of some of the uh, hardest places where he's tried to apply stream restoration projects, really being places where there was severe down cutting, not room for a floodplain, and places where there was hard infrastructure. Uh, do you have stories of how you've had to deal around hard infrastructure and any example of stories where you wanted to do an urban stream restoration project, but just after doing a risk assessment uh, or analysis, found out that, hey, this isn't a stream restoration project. We're just going to have to uh, harden the project. So, for example, one of the things that Dan said is he kind of started out doing stream restoration, but he almost hates trees now uh, because trees are always a maintenance issue if there's not enough floodplain corridor. So if you see somebody trying to squeeze a tree in there without enough floodplain, he just looks at it and say, well, that's just something I'm going to have to do work on in another 20 years and, and nobody's going to actually be out to do it. So it's just going to be an uh, emergency project for me. You know, I've found um, that probably the biggest um, conflict <clears throat> uh, with urban stream restoration is uh, getting people's uh, expectations well aligned. You know, everybody... You know, a lot of people, are, they want the natural stream. You're right. They want the function. They want the, you know, the, the beautiful trees and the fish jump in, you know, and and just the places where kids can go and reconnect. And and I think, um, you know, after working on several projects in different cities and different places, uh, really getting expectations aligned early on. What, what are you really expecting uh, and what's really what is really the potential there? Um, what, what are you going to get, you know, um, surprisingly, you know, sometimes the conversation might start more on the natural side of the spectrum. We want wood, we want trees, we want, you know, natural form. We want to restore the channel, but then, uh, you know, as, as watershed analysis leads you to learn that the, the flow regime and, and the sediment regime have been permanently modified, um, it's really important to take a look at it. You know, there are hard solutions um, and, and we've seen them where they work. You know, I, I'm not a fan of gabion baskets at all. Right. For instance, but 
and there's some places I've seen where they put gave you in baskets and they planted it, did joint planting, and now they're overgrown. And you know, <laughs> the wire mesh isn't gonna go anywhere. It's kind of tangled up in the wood, but it it's functioning. I don't know if something would have been better there or, but to the point is um, some of these hard treatments, maybe not Gavians, but some of these hard <laughs> treatments, there's, there's still potentials. Maybe they could have used boulders and joint planted boulders, you know, for instance. Um, I was in, when I was in Atlanta, we were right next to the wastewater treatment facility and they had, they had straightened I mean, there was some turns. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't a meander, but they had straightened a trapezoidal ditch, the channel and straightened it in places. And they had done that like over 30 years ago uh, because the hydraulics was conducive to it. There was a downstream road crossing that created backwater, limiting the, you know, limiting the potential for, for scour and, and, you know, erosive forces throughout that constructed reach. It, you know, we were like, what are we going to do here to improve this? And we thought, you know, we can't really. I mean, it's it was it looked like a priority for, you know, restoration urban. But but it, it was this was 30 years later and it had solid, you know, solid buffer with some trees and, and, and the banks were stable. And we've we've seen this a lot in Virginia and, and some of, you know, for instance, in Fairfax County, Um some of these hard treatments are actually working. And interesting, if you if you go to Mecklenburg County, uh, my hometown uh, in Charlotte, you, you can go from upstream to downstream and you can almost see the evolution of, of urban stream treatments and how some of our, our treatments have changed. But I really think, I, I you know, maybe pointing the discussion toward aligning uh, expectations. Um, and, and some of that comes from, you know, from the grant money, you know, people might have had some training and they're like, oh, we want to do this or the grant money says we're going to do that. So that's yeah. my, my my thing is getting Josh, those expectations aligned. Josh, you had a comment from uh, Sarah um, and uh, my eyes just aren't so good on a small screen, so I can't read the last name. It looks like Donat, Donatich, uh, but uh, um, you have it. <laughs> good, good. Um, and basically, uh, you know, you shared that you're you work for NC uh, uh, New York City Parks yeah. uh, with 60 miles of and you said you have 60 miles of fresh water streams. Um, you know, I was recently to New York City and uh, it's it's hard to even believe there's that many miles of fresh water streams uh, in New York City uh, just because, you know, you you look through it and you can see all the locations where streams had been and where now. Obviously, it wouldn't make sense to put a string back to since there's buildings there. Um, can you talk? Do you want to share anything about kind of what your program's doing or kind of what some of your challenges you are with trying to restore a function or re restore streams, daylight in streams or just stabilization of streams? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, actually, we have done a citywide assessment, which is how we know that there's 60 miles of freshwater streams back in 2017. Um, and I've since then come back to New York City Parks, but I led that field work. So, I mean, the main one issue, I guess I can talk about like sources of degradation, but, you know, as we all know, property is fragmented. So, of course, it's often reach scale because we can only work on parkland but we do actually have the opportunity we have a lot of parks within the same watershed and sometimes we do have contiguous connection which is very cool um, and something that's unique about being a land manager is that you can you know think and plan long term even though maybe other <laughs> people have ideas of things to do on your property but um so that's sort of a unique aspect you know, so much degradation comes from, of course, just developed watershed. So stormwater is the huge source, and then that leads to incision. So lots of head cuts and, um, yeah, but we still have, you know, so much life living here, like salamanders and, you know, our freshwater streams, then outlet to our salt marshes, which have so much going on as well. Um, so it is, it's pretty inspiring. Most of most of them, for you know anyone who's been here, they're not in Manhattan. They're in the Bronx and Staten Island. That's where most of our natural areas are, as we call them, um, along Queens and Brooklyn as well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot a lot of parks to see. The Bronx is the greenest borough. Um, I forget how many acres of parkland, but um, 
yeah, there's a lot to see. So that's just a little tidbit. <laughs> Yeah. What? Yeah, and definitely not what you think of when you think of New York City. So, yeah, but but you know what about um what is your role, Sarah? You work with uh... oh yeah, sorry. So I work with New York City Parks. I'm okay. basically I'm the hydrologist. I'm the the only water resources. Well, I just hired someone else, but we do all ecological restoration. Our bread and butter started with salt marsh restoration in the '90s, um, but since then, like we yeah I do stream restoration I'm trying well we've done some for example there's we're partnering with a city agency um, called the Department of Environmental Protection um, and we're daylighting a stream and, and the point is really to prevent combined sewer overflows because the stream goes into a pipe <laughs> so where if we daylight it and disconnect it then we won't we'll you know reduce so much um stormwater going into this combined sewer. So there's, you know, there's a lot of motivations like that um, that we can sort of harness to leverage funding. Um, but yeah, we do, I wouldn't say we have a stream restoration program, but I would say ecological restoration and it includes green infrastructure and um, stream rehabilitation and um, wetland restoration. Yeah. Yeah. I, reacting to what you just said, Sarah, that's great. I, I love what you guys are doing, but reacting is, um, uh, my reaction is noticing, um, you know, rather than say stream restoration, ecological restoration is more comprehensive. Stream already, it closes the box, right? It gives us a smaller space to work in. And, mm -hmm. you know, we understand that the water, the resource itself benefits from all sorts of things we do. You know, we don't want people to think that the only way to benefit the stream is, is by doing stream work. You know, we can do upland stuff. We can do management. We can do education outreach, you know. Right. And I would say that's actually fully what we do because we have a stewardship team. We have a crew team. We have, you know, what used to be our yeah forest restoration team. So it's it's very all of our projects are always sort of integrated in multiple aspects. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, and it's uh, it's I mean, in, in the last 30 years, we've kind of outgrown it a little bit. But stream restoration has kind of been like this exclusive society. You know, if you don't know thankful, you don't know shit. <laughs> but uh, I mean, but for real, it's it's beyond that. And I, what I like what you said is in the urban environments, um, there's a lot of parties, you know, a lot of people, they, they want to do good things for the streams, but really their primary concern is, is point source, you know, un, mm -hmm. un, unregulated point source discharge, for instance, or, yep. or, you know, I, I and I on, on sewer lines and, mm -hmm. And that's important to us too, right? That's that's that affects the resource. Mm -hmm. and so, I mean, glomming onto that is is I think my experience, um, probably similar to uh, many of you, is 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 just meeting the the benefactor where they are, you know, and, and understanding, you know, you're managing a utility or or a municipality or a roadway or a bridge or or a gas line or whatever it is, and and you know, in in these developed environments. And and meeting them there and understanding, embracing their 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 primary concern and their primary interest, and you know, bringing our tools, we're, we're pretty flexible. And I think that's maybe Dan's message was, you know, we don't always have to do completely natural. In fact, it's not always the best idea to to, to lean toward a completely natural. But understanding the natural process is certainly a, a pathway toward coming up with with you know creative urban solutions um that that's a good story uh sarah i think that's really exciting do you guys have now do you have um do you have like the the profile project like these are the types of projects we go after or do you find yourself and you know kind of going across the spectrum of different types of projects like um conservation versus active you know restoration or acquisitions or oh yeah we do we do acquisition we do <laughs> um yeah let me think about that <laughs> but uh so anyway to that point um and to dan maybe to to dan's point dave's getting sideways on us uh is, <laughs> is that um you know we need to be thinking out of the box and and thinking what's best for the resource and and realizing you know what is the dominant process here you know what what are the processes we're designing to in the case where we do have the opportunity to design and and let's 
you know, let's realize those constraints and meet those those folks where they're at. Because you know, the, the more the more palatable and the more we can we can dovetail as opposed to like, well, I guess you know, you you don't know Bankful, so you don't really know what you're doing. You know, let's let's kind of extend our community and and reach out uh, above and beyond. I love the education component. I, I always tell people. You know, it's it's not like we're going to run out of dirty diapers to change. And as many people as we teach how to, how to do sleep <laughs> restoration, that's still not going to fix it. The only so, thing that's going to fix it is if we can if we can d- deliver the, the 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 message. You know, the ministry of good stewardship and and elevating that and letting people know that where they are and what they do, they have an important place in 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 in, in the resource in resource management. If you're doing sewer lines. If you're doing, you know, water lines, if you're doing parks, if you're doing roadways, you're still an important player. And we want you to be part of this, you know, this circle of, of stewardship. And, you know, we have some tools. We just need to understand more about what the urban needs are, what the community expectations are. So you have a pretty developed program, Sarah, and you guys you guys kind of know where you're headed and where you're going. But uh, I, I feel like as, as more and more... Um, federal dollars or grant money or mitigation dollars are introduced into into the the uh the sector of of stewardship um we're going to find more people i think gosh that was lee was talking about this the other day and we were talking about how sometimes the grant funding dictates oh that this shall be you know this shall be the case and that shall be the case yeah josh um one of the things i think is very interesting is uh, sometimes grants follow fads uh, so, you know, sometimes people are doing stream restoration because the grant says to do stream restoration or people are doing low, uh, uh, low tech design because the grant says to do low tech design. And I think in urban stream restoration, one of the things that we really should be doing as an industry is we should be using these tools that we have available, like stream restoration and allowing the goal of ecosystem restoration to be uh, adjusted based on the goals and objectives of stakeholders, communities, landowners, uh, and use the tools of stream restoration opposed to saying, hey, we have to do stream restoration. Uh, And I think we're gonna get a lot closer towards uh, having more projects that are successful when we go into a project uh, trying to look at all the tools available to us opposed to just saying, hey, we have to have this end treatment or design that comes out looking like stream restoration because the grant was is looking for stream restoration uh, i had an i was uh in a class last uh, two weeks ago where they created an, an entire evaluation matrix in a watershed just to look at opportunities for low tech process based design which is okay but you've already defined the treatment it's, it's like, why would you go into a watershed and say, let's just look at opportunities of where we can do stream restoration. Let's just go into a watershed and decide, okay, well, where are the places that we have a need for something and does stream restoration fit that need? Um, so I see that as being something that as an industry where stream restoration is going to be applied in these urban systems a lot more than it probably has been before just because there's going to be a lot of money going towards green infrastructure, that we have to look at stream restoration as a tool to achieve a goal opposed to being the goal to achieve. Well, um, that's a good point, you know, but, uh, you, you know, you put yourself in the shoes of a lot of these administrators, you know, I, I, I use Atlanta and there are wonderful people down there. I had a really good experience, but I'm, as an example that, you know, their job is administration, you know, they're not, uh, and they're technically minded and smart people. That's how they got there. But their job, their focus is administration. So they've got, you know, they've got bunches of this stuff. And so they're looking for, you know, what can I, what can I get on the drive? You know, they're looking for, like you said, they, they're like, oh, here's a good solution that everybody likes and the grant funding likes. Where can we put that? And OK, if that's what you want to do, that let's find where that can be the, you know, the, the you know, one of the main pieces, uh, not not just where does it fit, where can we shoehorn it, but where where does that, what does that particular treatment serve? What problem does that serve? And where is this, where can, you know, maybe collectively uh, some of these treatments. So 
I mean, that's that's not very clear, but I guess my point is is, is agreeing with you, Dave, is is that the administration can oftentimes have a different focus. And that's that's again where I think getting getting ourselves and putting ourselves in their place and just really understanding um where they're coming from to try to keep that door open because honestly quite frankly if, if if it becomes too complicated or or we speak above someone else's use of terms uh you know and and we behave exclusionarily um people are going to walk away from it you know they're going to look for the products they can lay down on the banks instead you know whatever is easier and so not to say that administrators are looking for easy solutions it's just they have <laughs> i i I've learned that they tend to deal with more more problems uh, than I do, and so maybe maybe their 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 place where they're at is just different. So um, that's that's a good point. I, I know Lee's done a lot of this and seen that too. He's uh actually inspired. He's on the call. He's inspired me to kind of really understand where where people are coming from you know, whether it's an administrator or an agency, whoever's hosting the work in an urban environment. It's quiet. So I think a lot of that goes back to the idea of, uh, you know, how do we lay out goals and objectives and how do we allow those goals and objectives to be able to drive a project opposed to us deciding, hey, we're going to just drive the project and then uh, everybody's going to be happy with it. Um, so I do see that as being uh, a big shift. And I see it as some, being something that we haven't done traditionally well uh, in these uh, stream restoration spaces. Spaces We haven't really looked at uh, alternatives when we look at restoration just because it hasn't been taught by many groups on how to do an alternatives analysis for stream restoration, especially in an urban setting. More more outreach and, and more more partnering, you know, more more outreach. You know, when we do a roadway project, we have this whole outreach process, you know, the NEPA process where where we have this, you know, engaging the public and, and things of that nature. A lot of times our stream projects don't 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 operate that way. They're not as large in scale, but I think they're equally important to those communities that, that we do. So what we've often done, uh, what I, I like to do is is talk to whoever is the project administrator, project sponsors, if, you know, or maybe even before the funding, and and find out who who they can partner with internally, um, and and how they can reach out. So, for instance, uh, the uh, the the core pursuits, they're working with the city. The city's coming out and looking at the stream together. So, so maybe rather than just meeting them where they are, they're they're actually coming and meeting meeting us a little bit more where we are from the stream side. So, so maybe it's that communication, maybe it's just being more outward and, 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 you know, approachable as a community. All right. Does anybody have anything they want to add to the conversation today? We have a couple more minutes and then we're going to have uh, even Monica, Mona's on her way. Mona join us here. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I don't want to dominate the airspace. I, I, I think this is a really important topic. You know, I hope that people find that, you know, uh, we can reach out to each other, you know, have these conversations. Um, I bet everybody on this call has had, uh, you know, a range of experiences with these urban stream projects. And and I think really that's my my my, my take home on on urban projects is, you know, let's get connected. Let's let's talk to the people in those spaces and not just read the stream, you know. Recording in progress. Whoa. <laughs> All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes. We just transitioned to a bigger uh bigger screen here. So that way 
uh, E when I don't have to bump heads when we're trying to look at my key, my my phone screen. That would have been pretty awkward. So. Oh, sorry. All right. Eve just left. Oh. How <laughs> was that? I'm done. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's done. We're like, we're like, sorry, Eve. That was you were here too long. Go. <laughs> uh, hey. So, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Was that Chuck? Yeah. So, in my experience, not being involved directly with this type of stream restoration, but observing some of the projects that get put forward, is it a lot of times in these uh, situations, it's usually after some sort of crisis, the decision makers go with the tools that they know. And that, so, so therefore, we've been trying to influence uh, the decision makers to add these tools to their tool belt. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's exactly right, Chuck. Like even I know Lee's on the line. I don't know if he's available to talk, but I know he's trying to get some of the nature-based solution criteria that's out there, get it added to uh the um uh the tools being used for nature-based solutions. So if we have uh nature-based solutions that's floodplain connectivity, then let's add stream restoration as a tool box as a tool on that toolbox towards that, opposed to just leaving it at floodplain connectivity. So I do think that uh, just highlighting that it's a tool that can be used is going to be important in the future because there's going to be a lot of folks that are connected to opportunities for ecosystem enhancement through nature-based solution that unless we allow people to know that it's a tool, they won't even really know that they can restore streams. Yeah, I think that's... Uh really spot on there, Dave. And I think the sooner we get a the a new vision of, of the tool chest that we can present to people collectively, the better off we'll be because I mean I was really taken aback by the the backlash against cutting down trees any trees for stream restoration that we saw at the national conference in Maryland, which, you know, we, we think of the mid Atlantic and Chesapeake Bay watershed as the kind of one of the, one of the places where we, this were early adopters of, of these technologies to, to, to the purpose of trying to restore the, that watershed in the Bay and, but now it's come back full circle and there's uh you know pushback against stream restoration because they have to cut down trees, which you know, we've dealt with that uh same thing in a lot of urban projects. And I think we have to be able to to discuss that like we've been there before and and have enough uh grasp and of, of all the the tools that we could use and whether that's stream restoration or stream stabilization using some of the components of stream restoration where we don't have the the uh you know or we're too constrained to to apply a full stream restoration project the better off we'll be but um man it's really great that there's been a lot of work in new york city uh, and the different boroughs, that's that's like really uh, a game changer, I think, because that's always, I didn't, wasn't aware that was happening. So I was appreciative of that part of the talk because uh, that's, uh, to me, I've always thought of New York City as the, you know, well, that'll be the last place because it's so, uh, so armored there, you know, and so densely uh, 